Good morning. I want to welcome you today as we worship together in this online format for Good Shepherd United Methodist Church. On this day, we are finishing our series on Esther for such a time as this. And today we're going to talk about salvation and how God saves God's people. Let us pray together as we prepare to worship. As we enter worship this morning, I invite you to ponder a question. Do you need to be saved? If the answer is yes, from what do you need to be saved? And is there one who can save you? Today, God invites us to come and to sit in the quiet of this moment. For salvation indeed comes. It is here in this very moment. Let us worship and receive what only God can give. Brian's going to open us up this morning as we worship the living God together. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is God who saves. Our God is a God. church will stand she will endure he holds the keys of life our lord death has no stake no final word our god is god saves our god is a god saves let god arise The 
darkest night we worship you you divide the raging seas from death to life you safely lead oh praise the lord our mighty warrior praise the lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in of heaven crying out glory glory to the king you reign for all eternity oh praise the lord our mighty warrior praise the lord the glorious one by his hand we stand shall reign forever and ever the lord shall reign forever and ever the lord shall reign forever and ever the lord shall reign Good morning, Good Shepherd. When Linda Flanagan asked me to do the passing of the peace and the joys and concerns this Sunday, I agreed, even though it's been a pretty rough start to our school year. I didn't give it much thought at first, and then I remembered that I needed to actually say something about peace. I was praying and reading the scripture lesson today to help me direct my thoughts. Well, that took a mind that is all but peaceful right now into an even darker place. You see, I read what we'll be hearing Linda Crosby read in the scripture lesson today in a couple of different versions. And I had a difficult time wrapping my head around how peace was to come out of death threats, gallows, or impalement on a pike, uh, assault, or attempted rape. So I asked my family, and they said, well, when I don't know an answer, I Google it. So I did. And I found some lessons to learn from the story of Esther. Two of them jumped out at me. One is conflicts cannot always be avoided. And the next is they require action toward peace. This makes sense because we've learned that since Esther and the Jewish people could not escape Haman's threat, she had to take action to save her people. 
In John 16, 33, Jesus states, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So as it says in Romans 14, 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Good morning, everybody. I hope you all had an awesome week. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week with Queen Esther? What was our big idea or word that we talked about? Right, power. This week, we're going to finish Queen Esther's story and talk about something that is pretty huge and pretty important to our faith as Christians, salvation. Now, I know that's a pretty big word, but it's really important that we all know what it means. First, though, I want to tell you about the end of Queen Esther's story. Last week, we heard that Queen Esther finally got to talk to the king, but instead of asking right away for him to save her people, she invited king, the king and Haman, who if we remember is our bad guy in this story, to two banquets, not just one, but two, and she was throwing them in Haman's honor. At the second banquet, Queen Esther finally tells the king about Haman's plan to kill all of the Jews. The king becomes angry that Esther's people were put in danger by Haman, and he agrees to reverse Haman's order and save Queen Esther's people. How exciting! Queen Esther saved the day and the bad guy got punished, just the way we know that things should happen. But we also know that Queen Esther didn't do all of that alone. She had God on her side the entire time. Going back to that big word, salvation. That's what God is doing here. Salvation means being saved or delivered from something that would hurt you. Esther brought temporary salvation to her people. Salvation from Haman, at least. But that wasn't permanent. She didn't save them permanently. There's a whole lot of Bible left after Esther's story that tells us that the people of God still needed to be saved from something. It isn't until we get to Jesus all the way in the Gospels that we see God's salvation of God's people be completed. Jesus came to earth and then died on the cross to save all of us from the worst punishments of sin because God loves us that much. When we believe in God, when we get baptized and take our communion and go through confirmation, we are saved too. Will you pray with me, friends? Dear God, people like Queen Esther remind us of your power to save your people, to save us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus as the final and perfect reminder that you love us and want to save us from sin. Help us to remember that this week, that Jesus came to earth so that we could be saved once and for all. In your name we pray, amen. I'm reading from the book of Esther, chapter seven, verses one through 10. This is the first reading. So the king and Haman went to the feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have one your favor, O king, and it is, and it pleases the king. Let my life be given me, that is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have, if we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But 
no enemy can compensate for the damage to the king. Then King Hasus said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has presumed to do this? Esther said, a foe and an enemy, the wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king arose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king had determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining, and the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the words from the mouth of the king um, came, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbana, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, who, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's anger had been abated. The second reading is from the book of Esther, chapter 8, verses 3 through 8. When, it, when Esther spoke again to the king, she fell at his feet weeping and pleading with him to avert the evil design of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the, the Jews. The king held out the golden scepter to Esther, and Esther rose and stood before the king. She said, it, if it pleases the king, and if, it, if I find favor with the king, and if this thing seems right before the king, and I have his approval, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, son of Havantha, the Agagite, which he wrote giving orders to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming on my people? Or how can I hear, how can I hear or bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Hasus said to Queen Esther and to the Jew Mordecai, See, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he plotted to lay hands on the Jews. You may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. This is the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. For the singing, praise for the morning, praise for the springing, fresh from the world. Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from First do fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the wet garden, sprung in completeness where his feet pass. My 
Mine is the sunlight, mine is the morning, born of the one light Eden saw play. Praise with elation, praise every morning, God's recreation. Of the new day, as we prepare to hear God's word this day, would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God. We as your people come this day needing you, needing to be saved in every way. As we hear the story of Esther come to its conclusion, may we also know that you are with us in our stories day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to give you a seminary word today called soteriology. Now, this sounds like a big word, soteriology, but it is a very important word in the life of our Christian faith. For soteriology is the study of salvation, where it comes from, who can offer it, and what we need to be saved. As Christian persons, it is how we understand our need of being saved and the one who comes to offer that that we call salvation. Salvation doesn't always come in the ways that we expect or desire. But the question, the question of soteriology and of our faith is this. Do I need to be saved? As you ponder that, let's return to Esther. In our last week of our journey through Esther, we see a salvation story unfold as Esther presents the king with her request to save her people. Haman, remember Haman who had, had, had given that edict that all of the Jewish people would be annihilated under the king's order and seal? Haman has been summoned to a second banquet with the queen and with the king. Remember, Esther set up two different opportunities to be with Haman to, to set the stage and the tone for what was to come as she needed to tell the king what was to happen. Well, as the banquet begins, the king again asks Esther, what is your petition? Because it shall be granted to you even to half of my kingdom. Remember, he said that when she came before him the first time. And here again, he asks, what do you want? What do you need from me? Essentially, the king stands in the place of savior for Esther, willing to get her what she needs, willing to give her whatever salvation she's requesting. But only to a point. Remember, half of his kingdom, half of what he has. There is much that he wants to hold back. But in this desperate moment, Esther knows that it will be enough. It will have to be enough to save her people. And so Esther makes her plea for salvation for the Jewish people. And she says, if I have won your favor, let my life be given to me and the lives of my people. Salvation is about life being given to us. Life in every way one can conceive of it. Being saved from that which keeps us from experiencing fullness of life. Esther wants her life, her physical life. She wants the life the physical lives for her people. But I think she's asking for more underneath all of that. Her words echo Moses. 
when Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go. Remember that? Remember that he too asked for life for his people. And again, it wasn't just physical. It was to live in fullness and freedom. Well, Esther stands before her king and she begs for her life and the lives of, of God's chosen people. Notice she claims those people as her own, even as Moses did. You know, Moses had been part of Pharaoh's life and his Jewishness had been hidden, remember? Taken from the water, a Jewish baby, because Pharaoh had ordered that all the Jewish children be killed, all the boys under two. He too had to hide his Jewishness and still finally he stood before Pharaoh and requested freedom for his people. Let my people go. Likewise, Esther stands before the king and she unveils herself and she claims who she is, my people, my life. Such a contrast there is to the beginning of this narrative when Vashti refused to unveil herself physically, as it were. And here Esther lays herself spiritually and emotionally bare and claims her identity. She tells the king of what is to happen to her and to her people if he does not stop one who has put in motion the destruction of the Jewish people. Well, the king clearly doesn't really understand what she's talking about. He doesn't relate this to the recent order that Haman has given. It has not yet dawned on him that Esther is talking about the edict to eradicate the Jews. An edict that had been sealed with his very own signet ring, his seal, his sign. And so he asks almost ignorantly, well, who would do this to you and your people? Who would do this? And with those words, Haman's fate is sealed. I can almost see Haman sort of off in the corner somewhere saying, wait, what? Uh-oh. And trying to plan his sort of quiet escape out the side door, perhaps. In the moment that Esther confronts the king, she makes a choice to work for the salvation of her people. She is no longer enslaved by her station, her role, her gender. She allows God to use her to be the heroine in this narrative. And in so doing, in the words of Marjorie Bankson, she moved out of slavery into freedom. Salvation is about moving out of bondage to sin, to that which weighs us down, to living life that is empty than, rather than full. It is about freedom from all that keeps us from being the full creations that God has made us. From that which oppresses, from that which kills body, mind, and spirit. When the king asks who is responsible for the impending harm to Esther and her people, Esther responds, and one can almost see her as this portrait you see on the screen before you, pointing at him, pointing at him with accusation as she says, Haman, this evil one, Haman, Well, the king rises up in anger and he leaves, presumably, to contemplate this turn of events. Because remember, he's put Haman in all of this position of authority. Haman had all the power and all the glory because the king had given it to him. And one might think that the king might have known what this edict had said. But clearly he didn't understand the impact, particularly on his queen. Well, meanwhile, in a total, total turnabout, Haman begs Esther for his life. Esther is suddenly the one in control. Esther is the one to be Haman's savior, as it were. 
He has gone from being the powerful to the powerless, and, and Esther has gone from one who represents an oppressed and powerless people to one who now has his life in her hands. Haman begs salvation from the one whose life he sought to take. Well, after the king contemplates all that he has heard, he returns and he finds Haman atop of Esther. He threw himself on the couch where she was as he's begging her for his life. And this is the final straw for the king. We read that the eunuchs cover Haman's face. The king didn't even want to look at him anymore. He couldn't absorb that this man was harming the queen, assaulting the queen. Kind of interesting, again, if you look back to how this all started and the treatment that he had of Vashti. The king then orders Haman hanged on the very gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai. Esther returns to the king one more time, again without having been summoned, and again he holds out his scepter, and she gets specific this time. She asks that her people be spared from the impending destruction. But the king is clear that his earlier order cannot be revoked. He says, once it's duly written and sealed, I can't change it. Well, can I pause for just a moment here to ask why? I mean, he, after all, was the king, right? The king ostensibly could do what he pleased. He could stop. This is where he's only willing to go so far. He's only willing to make himself look bad so much. And he stands on the tradition of this is how it is done, this is how it has always been. And it would make me look bad. He's only willing to give so much of his kingdom. Half, not all. Half of who he is, not all. Half of the salvation that is needed. And so Esther and Mordecai must take what they can get. And so they issue their own edict. Under the signet of the king, he's allowed them to do this. Allowing the Jewish people to defend themselves. And on the day when the Jewish people were to have been annihilated, they are able to defend themselves with great might against those who would still seek to destroy them. I'm guessing, though, that those who originally were going to do that maybe didn't come out in quite as great of a force. The Jewish people ultimately were saved. But salvation comes in an incomplete way for them. For the problem of oppression and rejection of the Jewish people is nowhere near solved. The problem of oppression for any people is nowhere near fixed. As long, you see, as humans are the source of our salvation, it never will be. Salvation is incomplete if we rely upon human beings to give it to us. Because human beings are always going to be like this king and say, well, you can have some, maybe half, maybe three quarters, maybe one quarter, some, a little bit. It's always incomplete. And, and that's in part because when we refuse to cooperate with God, the work of salvation has limits. Nonetheless, this day, when the Jews are finally granted salvation in that moment, will come to be marked, even to this time, as Purim, a festival to celebrate how God recast the pure and saved God's people. This celebration to this day, which tends to happen in February, beginning of March, includes a reenactment of the drama around Esther. Now, some of us will be dressing up in Halloween costumes today, but on Purim, the children and adults dress up in costumes, not scary monster costumes, but costumes that tell this drama anew, that allow the people to enter into this story again of this salvation. 
They even eat many sweet pastries, include a little thing called hamantaschen. I don't know if you've ever had hamantaschen, but it's a really wonderful pastry. Now I lift this up not because it tastes good, but do you hear the first part of that word hamantaschen? Haman. Which translated can mean the weakening of Haman. And so they eat, they, they reenact this drama, and they eat this sweet to be reminded that God can weaken humans in order to create salvation. The narrative of Esther is that the die may be cast, but God can still work. Humans may only say, I'm going to give half and, and only cooperate so much, but God can still work. And so as we stand here today before God, the royal one of God, salvation has come to us. It matters not where we have been, what we have done, the choices we may have made, whether we have been willing to participate just a little bit or a lot. Salvation is in front of us. And it's full. And it's complete. It's like these banquets that the king kept throwing. It's there. It's there for us to feast on. Unlike the king with Esther, God holds nothing back from us. We can be completely and totally free in the name of Jesus the Christ. We only need to come before God, ready to bow down and receive the gift, to be pardoned by God's almighty scepter and to gain access to the heart of God in the name of Jesus the Christ. The story of Esther isn't of an incomplete salvation, but the story of Jesus the Christ is one of completion. Literally on the cross, Jesus speaks these words, it is completion. It's done. I've given all, everything. I've held nothing back. To all who are willing to receive the gift of God's salvation and to believe in the one who brings it in Jesus the Christ, there is power to become children of God, we read in John's Gospel. We who are powerless in our sin find power and discover our true identity once and for all. We find that we are clothed in the righteousness of God, faultless to stand before God's throne, not because of anything we've done, not because of anything any human has done, but because of who God is. God is a God who longs for us to be free, to be saved, to be real, to be full in our life. We are saved not for ourselves alone, but also that we might become a part of the amazing salvation story of God. Esther had the privilege of being part of this salvation narrative. She was faithful in accepting the gift of salvation that God wanted to offer through her and to her. Likewise, we have been set free to bring others to freedom to allow others to embrace this gift, to allow others to know that there is no evil, oppression, sin, ism, that can truly hold them down. And there's much in this world that still is doing that. This is not just a story from the Bible from long ago where God's name is never mentioned but clearly is so fully part of it. This is still our story in a world where God's name is rarely mentioned in, in many corners or, or mentioned in ways that justify oppression and sin in ways that are unscriptural and have nothing to do with salvation. We are saved and we are sent forth to share with them this drama, this unfolding drama, this sweet story that salvation has come. And it is a sweet fragrance, like Hadassah was a sweet fragrance to her people. We are sent at such a time as this. May this day, may we receive the gift of God's grace and love that God longs to save our lives into fullness, and may we offer that sweetness in this world. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen.
It's time for joys and concerns. Uh, we have a great joy. Brian Morrissey is retiring from his service in the US Secret Service for our, after all these years. Uh, we also have some concerns and some people that we would like to lift up in prayer. The family of Carolyn Rochelle, whose celebration of life was last week at Good Shepherd, and the family of Bar Barry Cramp, who was a longtime Good Shepherd member um, who passed away on August 16th. The Paraguay family are caring for Bob's sister, Sue, who may be moved to hospice care soon. Um, Sue Norris, still recovering. Alan Ward, who is recovering from his eye surgery. Reverend Lori and the rest of their family as she still is recovering from her heart surgery. Joe Haley's requested prayers for Julianne and Lauren who have COVID. And we'd like to add everyone else who has it and all of their caretakers and, and service providers. The Adgates have let us know they have a friend, Emilio, who is also hospitalized with COVID. We include our prayers uh, for schools, parents, teachers, students, and other staff, and especially for our School of the Week, Dr. Gustavus Brown Elementary School. We would like to add the first responders in all fields, and leaders at all levels of government, and also for everyone suffering in our world. Um, please take a moment to add your own prayer requests. Dear God, holy are you, and we thank you for all of our blessings. May you hear our prayers, both spoken and thought. And may we find your presence as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to now invite you to consider what God is asking you to invest in the kingdom of God. You have been faithful as you have supported the work of Good Shepherd, and we are so grateful for that. We want to continue to ask you to do that work of support of this ministry here at Good Shepherd and far beyond. As always, there is information on your screen about how to give, whether virtually or in person, by mailing a check to the church. But as you give, know that God longs to use that which we invest in the work of God to bring hope and salvation to all of God's people. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, for that which you have placed in our hands, we say thank you. For the ability to participate with you in bringing good news to your children throughout the world, we again rejoice. So now, Lord God, receive these gifts that we release from our hands and put back into yours, that indeed salvation might come in many ways, many shapes, many sizes to those throughout this world who need it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory. Just judge ruling over us with kindness and freedom. We will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you. A mighty fortress is our God. Shakeable with you forever, we will reign. Our God is jealous of his own, none can comprehend his love and his mercy. Our God is exalted on his. High above the heavens, forever he's worthy. We will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you. A mighty fortress is our God, a sacred refuge.
Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. We are so glad that you took the time to worship with us this day. I hope that as you have worshiped, you have felt God reaching out to you and offering you the gift of salvation, the gift of being saved from that which weighs you down, the gift of freedom. Let us go out this day to continue to live out that beautiful gift of God. Will you receive now this prayer? Wherever the road leads, let us walk with assurance, knowing that God will never lead us astray. When darkness falls, may God's hand reach down to hold ours and guide us towards light. When the cold winds blow, may we find shelter in the warmth of God's love. So as we go, let us never fear, for we know that God is always with us at every time, in every place. Thanks be to God. Amen. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle wide, draw it wide. This be our song. No one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Stands alone, we'll stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song. No one stands alone, standing side by side. Sir.